But I teach this course in a more traditional way. When we've got a classroom full of students, at the beginning of the term, I spend a fair bit of time trying to let the students get a look at how psychologists think about the world. And one of the first things that we have to decide is how we decide what's true and what isn't true. And throughout this term, I want you to examine that question for yourselves. Uh, there are a lot of things out there that you believe absolutely to be true. There are other things that you reject. You know that they are not true. And there are probably some things in the middle that you think maybe it's true, but you're not sure. But you probably haven't thought very much about how you make that decision. What standards do you use? In the sciences in general, and in psychology in particular, one of the hardest things uh, for non-scientists to accept is the fact that for the scientist, nothing can ever be proven to be true. You can prove that things are not true, but you can never prove absolutely that something is true. So we have to stop thinking in terms of being absolutely certain of anything. And the best we can really do is accept something as true for the time being, based on the evidence we have, but always keep our mind open to the possibility that we may have to change our mind about that uh, later on. I've been teaching psychology for a long time, and many of the things that I taught as true 25 or 30 years ago, I no longer teach as true because we've learned new things and the nature of what we believe and what we uh, don't believe has changed. So I want you to avoid using the word prove, but even my senior psych majors continue to use this word all the time. They say that the results of their study proved that their hypothesis was true. Well, no, it hasn't. The results of the study were consistent with the hypothesis. It supports the hypothesis, but it never can absolutely prove that it's true. Another problem is that I don't think most people make a distinction between believing something and knowing something. For most people, if you really believe something, then you think you know it. But the two things are quite different. Believing is uh, hoping almost that something is true without really having any evidence. Knowing is accepting something is true based on actual data or evidence. So this term, I want you to um, become familiar with some of the basic ways in which psychologists think about things. And I'm gonna run down a list of some of the different principles that are lying underneath the surface of, psych surface of psychological thinking. <coughs> First, um, be skeptical. You're gonna run into a lot of outrageous claims uh, in your life, uh, little bracelets you can put on that will improve your balance and um, pills that you can take that will improve your memory and tests that you can take that will reveal your true personality based on color preferences and things like that. Well, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't. And the more remarkable the claim is, the more spectacular the evidence should be in order for you to accept that it's true. So uh, regard things in a skeptical way. Uh, don't be so gullible and easily convinced. And the principle of parsimony, sometimes called parsimony, depending on where you're from, um, says that if you've got a couple of different explanations for something, accept the simplest explanation as the most likely and best explanation, unless you get evidence to the contrary. Empiricism. Uh, psychologists, for the most part, don't decide what's true and what's not true uh, by just thinking about it. We rely on data from empirical studies. Uh, we like um, things we can measure, things that we can see. So psychology is an empirical science. We also tend to like numbers, so we like to think about things quantitatively. This makes us a little different than the social sciences, uh, other social sciences, where um, anthropologists and sociologists, for example, often do much more qualitative research where they interview people and do participant observation in communities and don't 
think about things quite so quantitatively. I'm not saying that one approach is good and the other one is bad, but they are different. And the quantitative thinking is one of the things that makes psychology different from other social sciences. Empiricism uh, is one of the things that makes us different from uh, fields like philosophy, where the philosopher is often interested in the very same questions the psychologist is interested in, but the philosopher typically uh, is not relying on empirical data to draw conclusions or to figure out how things work. Psychology also is primarily an experimental field. We test hypotheses by manipulating variables uh, and creating conditions and experiments. And we'll talk about this in quite a bit of detail in module two. Another thing that's uh, sometimes difficult for my students to uh, accept is that psychologists accept the principle of scientific determinism. What this means is that we believe that psychological phenomena, behavior, thoughts, emotions, all happen in a very causal, uh, logically explainable way. Um, they are determined by factors that can be understood. Let me describe how scientific determinism works in psychology by using an analogy that I think is pretty simple to grasp. Um, think about a pool table, a billiard table. When I hit the cue ball with the, the, the cue and break the balls and they go scattering around the table, I accept the principle that where each and every ball ends up on the table is determined by the laws of physics. And that if I knew everything I needed to know, I could predict exactly the spot that each ball on the table will end up in when they stop rolling around. So if I knew how level the table was, if I had the exact angle of impact by the cue ball, if I knew the degree of spin that was happening, if I had all of those factors together, I should be able to predict where the balls are going to end up. Now, I'm not a very good pool player, so I can't come close to doing that. A very good billiard player probably can become come pretty close to making that prediction, uh, although they won't be perfect. But whether you can predict it or not, you believe that the balls are determined to do what they do by the laws of physics. And the fact that you don't know everything you need to know to predict that doesn't change the assumption that the behavior of the billiard balls is determined. Well, we think about humans the same way. Uh, if I brought two people together and introduced them for the first time, if I knew all of the relevant things about each person, their developmental history, their brain chemistry, and all of those things, I ought to be able to predict um, what the people would say to each other, what their thoughts would be, how the people would feel about each other, because those things are determined through a lawful scientific process to happen the way they happen. Now, as with the billiard balls, I can't predict exactly what's going to happen in those situations because I don't have all of those variables. But that doesn't change the assumption that the behaviors I'm looking at were determined to happen the way they happened in a lawful way. Now, uh, I understand that a lot of people don't like this deterministic way of thinking about human behavior. I'm not even asking you to believe it or accept it in your own life, but you need to understand that when psychologists are doing research on humans, they are taking this perspective because if human behavior is not determined in a scientifically lawful way, there's no point in studying it scientifically because it doesn't play by the rules. Uh, so uh, throughout the term, as you're reading about the, the research in the textbook, uh, keep in mind that this assumption is very much in place. And for emphasis, let's take a look at them one more time. I believe that there are some real benefits to uh, thinking like a psychologist, obviously, or I wouldn't be a psychologist. First of all, um, it helps you prevent confusing observations with inferences. Uh, in my class, uh, when we talk about this, I sometimes will hold up a piece of chalk and I ask the students to tell me, what do you know about this thing just by looking at it? In other words, I'm asking them for their observations. 
and they will say things like, it's white, it's shaped like a cylinder, you can write with it, if you drop it, it will break. And then we examine the list of things that the class has come up with, and we see that some of them are observations, but some of them are inferences. So, for example, when they say that something is white or something is cylindrical, those are in fact observations. Those are things you are seeing by looking at the object. But to tell me that I can write with it or that it will break if I drop it are inferences. You have not observed that. Uh, based on your observations, you've deduced that this thing is a piece of chalk. And based on what you know about chalk, you tell me these other things, but you haven't directly observed them. And confusing observations and inferences um, can lead to problems, especially if you're a scientist trying to figure out the way the world works. Another thing that this kind of psychological thinking can do is protect us from our own intuition. And sometimes students wonder what I mean by that because they take a psychology class because they think they have good intuition. And shouldn't they be relying on intuition? I'm not saying your intuition is always wrong. Sometimes it can be very good. The problem is our intuition has existed not, not to tell us what's true, but to tell us what's useful to us. And so we have biases built into our the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about our social world, and we're not programmed to see the world in an objective way. And our intuition can lead us astray. So when you hear somebody very smugly talk about their intuition and going with their gut, what they're really revealing is they're completely unaware of the biases that are built into our intuition. And uh, this is related to something known as the hindsight bias, which occurs when you hear something that sounds right to you, it matches your common sense or your intuition, and therefore you think you already knew it. So watch out for this in this course when you're studying. You'll read some things that sound very familiar to you, and you'll say, well, yeah, I knew that, but you didn't. And this leads us to a related problem that I like to refer to as Bubba psychology. The word Bubba psychology is derived from the old Yiddish word for grandmother, booby. And this is psychology that everybody's grandmother knows is true. So why bother studying it? Let me give you an example. Let's suppose I got a big research grant to find out what draws people together in romantic relationships, what makes people attracted to each other. So I spend years collecting data all over the world. I spend a lot of money. And then when it's over with a great fanfare, I announce to the world that I have discovered that people who are very different from each other, who complement each other, actually are the ones that are drawn together in romantic relationships. So for example, if you are an extroverted individual who likes to be the center of attention, you're gonna perhaps be most compatible with a person who's less extroverted, who likes to stay out of the spotlight, somebody who will not be competing for attention with you. Um, or if you're an individual who likes to nurture and take care of people, you'll probably be happiest with somebody who likes to be nurtured and taken care of. You'll make a good compatible team. So uh, when I announced this finding, people laugh and they say, really? Opposites attract. Everybody knows that. My grandmother knows that. You didn't need to spend all of those years, all of that money to figure out something everybody already knew. On the other hand, let's suppose I spent the time and money and came out with a very different conclusion and announced that people who are very similar to each other in most ways are the ones that are going to be drawn together in romantic relationships. Well, now you look at those results and say, ha, birds of a feather flock together. Everybody knows that. My grandmother knows that. You didn't need to spend all of that time and money uh, to find that out. So the problem is we have these little bits of common sense wisdom floating around that can explain everything, but they can't all be true. So if you're relying on Bubba's psychology uh, on a test, and the question is which one of the following statements most accurately describes what draws people together, A, opposites attract, B, birds of a feather flock together, you're, you're kind of stuck, aren't you? Oh man, 
Both of these things are right. How can that be? Well, um, just to look ahead a little bit, birds of a feather do flock together. Opposites do not attract, but we'll talk about that later in the course. So anyway, um, becoming skeptical of these common sense bits of wisdom that are floating around is a good thing. <clears throat> Thinking like a psychologist might also help you avoid the power of the particular. The power of the particular is what happens when we find ourselves very much persuaded by a compelling story. We're programmed to like stories about individual people, and we give it much more weight than we should, and we tend to weight it more heavily than more accurate but abstract statistical information that explains how something works. Uh, so for example, if I were to say to you, men are taller than women, most of you would immediately understand that I was speaking about a general law and you wouldn't object and say, now, wait a minute, that's not true. I know a woman who's taller than some men uh, because you understand that's not the nature of the argument I'm making. But yet people will make the same kind of argument in other ways. So if I were to say, you know, smoking causes lung cancer, uh, a person may very well object and say, now, wait a minute, I had an uncle who smoked three packs a day for 80 years and he lived to be 95 years old. You can't tell me that smoking causes lung cancer. The story of that one individual outweighs all of the other data in this person's mind and, uh, and it shouldn't. And so another uh, bias that we have to worry about then is the confirmation bias. We like information that confirms what we already believe to be true. We actively seek it out. So uh, for example, if you believe in ESP, if you believe that it's possible um, for people to know things that they couldn't possibly have known uh, through some sort of psychic process, you're more likely to see it in situations that confirm that belief. For example, let's suppose you believe in ESP and last night you were thinking about some individual that you went to kindergarten with and you were good friends. And then that person moved away and you haven't seen them for ever since. And you just got to wondering, I wonder whatever happened with that person. And then the very next day, you got a Facebook friend request from that individual. Whoa, I'm psychic. If you believe in ESP and something like that happens, that confirms and strengthens the belief, and we cling to that information and remember it well. That's called confirmation bias. But what about all the times you thought about somebody that you hadn't seen in a long time, and there was no Facebook request? Or what about the times you got these weird Facebook requests from somebody you hadn't thought about in a long time? Those things you just disregard, but whenever there's a coincidence, um, we hop on it and say, aha, I knew that my belief was correct. So that's what confirmation bias is all about. And this can lead to something that's called an illusory correlation, where we see what we expect to see. And so, um, as you're going through the course, I want you to continue to think about this question of how you decide for yourself whether something is true or not. And uh, keep in mind that we can't ever know for sure that something has been proven to be true.